Okay, so I'm doing this without notes. Not sure if that's a good idea. Not sure if that's sensible. But so far, I have recorded three different versions of this as a long patrol. And I haven't liked any of them. So I've chucked away my notes. Open up the window so I can hear the wind blowing in the air. I'm going to crack open a fresh can of iron brew. And we're going to get into the most annoying and damaging myths about the Royal Navy in the treaty years in World War II. And I'm going to start off by saying something rather similar to what I said during the live. Before anyone asks, watching this, iron brew is a soft drink. There occasionally seems to be some misunderstandings in the comments about whether I'm getting sozzled. I don't drink alcohol. I'm not getting sozzled. My reason for it, and I'll explain it again because the channel has grown since I last explained this, for not drinking is because my dad, who was a lovely man, a very good naval architect, and absolutely really quite a nice guy. Apart from when he drank, then he'd occasionally, well, actually quite often, get violent, and if I give you the example of the last time I saw him for 10 years when I was 16, was when he'd come home drunk and he didn't realise I was home, and decided to, let's put it this way, be very aggressive towards my mum and sister. He didn't manage to actually lay a hand on them because I appeared and got in the way. And the memory I had for ten years after that was of me holding him up against the wall and telling him very clearly that if he laid a hand on either of them, I would have broken every single bone in his body. I was a sixteen-year-old boy. But he was absolutely sozzled, and it wasn't good. And since then, in fact even before then, I don't drink. So, the strongest liquid I have is Iron Brew, which is about the strongest soft drink you can get. And it also makes me acceptable to the Scottish half of my family, despite I having me, me having this accent. So, leaving that all to one side. Most annoying and damaging myths about the Royal Navy in the treaty years in World War II. There are so many to pick from. I have picked roughly nine roughly nine to talk through but there are so many there are so many myths and so many of them come from those two combinations which are always the key part of a myth of good mythology one usually it's trying to you know big up something. It's trying to make another faction seem better. Werboos are a good source of myth. If people don't know what who a werboo is, they're the people who usually claim that Germany was an amazing military power in some regard. Um, they weren't amazing. They were capable in some regards, yes. But they really weren't amazing. And as a naval power they became very, very one-dimensional, especially by the end of World War Two, and frankly, that makes them a lot easier to deal with. Uh, you, as a naval power, the, the worst thing you can do is become a one-dimensional threat. You make it very easy for your opponent to work out how to deal with you. It's like rock, paper, scissors. The threat, the problem in it, is the fact that someone can go for a rock or a paper or a scissors. You know, that there's an option. That it, How do you respond to that? And if you respond with the wrong one, let's say they go paper and you go rock because you thought they were going to go scissors, well, you lose. But if they always, always go scissors, you just go rock. You might the first time make the mistake of going paper. Well, terrible. But the next time you go rock, and the next time you go rock, and the next time you go rock. And it doesn't matter how big and how scary and how capable the scissors get. It's very easy because you just improve the rock. So, 
the worst thing you can do for a fighting a navy or fighting in any kind of formation or warfare is just go, we're going to go down to a one dimension of this. It's like with modern for, uh, modern for, formations. If you suddenly went, right, we're going to be entirely an air power force. That's great. Right up, uh, but that also means that Okay, first thing for any opponent is work out, how do we strip you of that ability to project your air power? Hmm. Well, there will always be a problem somewhere in line, so it's probably going to be logistics. So let's see, if you've got air power, can you really secure your logistics line if you've just focused in on air power? Probably not. Because you don't want to fly in fuel. And you certainly don't want to fly in ammunition. It's expensive. It doesn't give you enough of a supply, and it's also quite easy to cut. In a peer conflict. And there is a the phraseology of peer warfare that gets problematic, in that people automatically mean peer is going to mean someone who's militarily equal. Well, in the 19, late 1930s, there are, is a, there are peers at the top. By treaty, the British Empire and America are supposed to be the same. The reality is the British have more aircraft carriers in service. The British have more destroyers in service at various points, more cruisers in service at various points. You know, Basically, the Americans uh, tend to be limited by their own Congress, which was sort of a whole calculation of the British in the treaty system. That, con uh, that whilst they would pay to max out their treaty allocations, the US Congress would be um, tight wads. That's it, basically. And wouldn't. And if you look at some of the things the US Navy is forced into because of the US Congress behaving in that manner, you really do see that the British made the right calculation, especially in the 1920s and uh, most of the 1930s. Unfortunately, te uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, the biggest voice for the US Navy in US politics, dies. And Franklin Roosevelt, well... It shows the family's continued commitment to naval affairs. But he is a far better politician than Teddy Roosevelt was, Theodore Roosevelt. But he's not as good a strategist as Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt was. You win some, you lose some. It's advantageous in one way, and disadvantageous in the other way. But there again, the British also have Winston Churchill. And let's be honest, if it hadn't been for his decision to pause both capital ship and carrier construction against the recommendation of the Royal Navy, the Royal Navy understood and were agreed to the idea of pausing capital ship construction. They didn't think it was necessary, because they'd already ordered, and I'll get into this bit, the Hunt class escort destroyer, what will be escort destroyers, and the Royal Navy at this point was still destroying, whether they call them fast sloops, escort destroyers, etc., what sort of things to call them. They end up going with escort destroyers because of various reasons, and the flag class corvettes. So, they wasn't went, well, we've already got the crash program started. We don't need to pause. Oh, no, we need to pause capital ships. We need to pause carriers so we can, and cruisers. We need to pause all these things so we can concentrate on these things. We're already building like 160 of these escorts. Why do we need to pause our larger ship construction? Because we must. Hmm, great. Basically, Churchill is very lucky at that point because the third Sea Lord is not Hem Admiral Henderson because Ad Henderson, by that point, had died. He'd been the third Sea Lord since pretty much 1933. And he had been in charge of naval construction since 1933. And whereas Fraser was a particularly nice person, fairly decent, but really a good all-rounder, but not, no white or warrior, no really... Uh, massive status anywhere. Henderson was enough of a white warrior, he probably would have... <clears throat> How do I put this politely? Minimised Churchill's ability to muck around with his construction programme. 
Mrs. Henderson caused uh, uh, Churchill enough trouble, so uh, goodness knows what her husband would have caused. Anyway, leaving that to one side, the Royal Navy is preparing for World War II. It is building things. It actually has, I'll be getting into this, aircraft carriers and all sorts of things under construction in 1939. They're then paused. And the trouble is with pausing construction is people go, oh, well, you've paused construction. Don't worry. It's only got X months left to complete, so we can just pick it up. You can't just pick it up because the people will move around. Their skills will fade. You might not restart with the same people you start, you were, were building it with. You're also probably going to learn information and want to put that new information into changing the designs. The more you change designs, the longer it's going to take to deliver them. In other words, the moment you pause construction on anything, you make yourself a nightmare. You do. And you start, you make yourself look an idiot. And this coupled with a few other things that are decisions that are made at the beginning of World War II, for various reasons, have given rise to all sorts of strange mythologies about the Royal Navy. And I know I have already talked about the Roosevelts, and Churchill and done some sort of discussion of politics, but I want to confirm something I'm going to be saying in this video a lot. Whatever I'm saying about the Royal Navy doesn't mean I am inadvertently or without saying it being rude about another Navy or saying they're not as good. It's not a zero-sum sum game. It's not. People can be, other navies can be good. They can be good in different ways. A system which might be excellent for the Royal Navy and work really great for their planning of war might be absolutely terrible when you put it into the American or Japanese or German or Italian metrics of how they plan to do a war. But it's also just as true vice versa. The system which is really, really good for the U.S. Navy might not be a system which is really, really good for the Royal Navy. And the thing is, both can be good systems. Both can be really, really good systems, but they're good in different ways because they're designed to fit their nation's geostrategic needs, i.e. where they operate in the world and how far that is away from their industrial base. They are designed to fit their doctrine and concept of operations, i.e. are they about continual operations, are they about night fighting, are they about delivering a big punch, are they allowed about blasting through. All sorts of things will affect what ships what designs, what equipment best suits you as a Navy. So please, I want to emphasize this. Me saying something is good in contrast to the mythology, which might have grown up around something, does not mean I am saying something else of another uh, service is bad, or even that their methodology or their doctrine is bad. I'm not. It suits them. It suits what they're planning to do. Because guess what? One size really doesn't fit all. It really doesn't. So, here at the myths we're going to be looking at. The prime myth that the Royal Navy was dominated by battleship admirals. The progeny of this that come off, uh, the Royal Navy didn't understand value naval aviation. The Royal Navy didn't understand value submarine warfare. The Royal Navy wasn't preparing for a war, only started preparing in World War II, 1939. These are all crash emergency builds, emergency programs, yes. Including my favorite is, there's some people who literally will turn around and tell me, oh yes, the flower class corvettes, all the escorts, etc., they were all ordered by Winston Churchill. The moment he became Lord of the Admiralty, he stopped capital ship construction because that was stupid. He, they forget, he stopped carrier and cap a cruiser construction as well. And he, start, he ordered the immediate production of emergency corvettes and emergency this, that, and the other. And you sort of go, no, he didn't. For starters, most of those ships have been laid down in March. 
about six months before he gets anywhere near the Admiralty. Uh, uh, it's impressive. It's impressive if you can be acting as First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, you know, First Lord of the Admiralty, and issuing orders and changing whole programs when you're not even in the bill, and uh, not, uh, not even in the cabinet in that role. And are currently on the outs with the current Prime Minister. It's an amazing, it would be an amazing feat if it was true. It's not. But there again, there is a reason for the Royal Navy preparing as it is. Annoying myths. If Germany won the Battle of Britain, they would have won Operation Sea Lion. Well, A, I have a big problem with the idea of them actually winning the Battle of Britain. Uh, but B, winning Operation Sea Lion requires a humongous more amount of work than just winning the Battle of Britain. For starters, there's the ships they're planning on using. And to get their people across. <laughs> we'll leave that to one side. It's a large river crossing. No, the channel is not a large river crossing. For starters, when storms turn up in the channel, you will soon notice that it is very different than a river crossing. And you might think it's going to be a nice, calm, sunny day, but there is no such thing in the centre of the channel. It's, it, it, it's choppy. Your people are going to be getting seasick. And um, that's... Before anything nasty turns up, and good luck logistics after the first night. If you do manage to get across in a day, the, the, whatever you're left with at the end of the first night is not going to be anything to do with it. We'll get into that, though. The swordfish was a relic of an aircraft. Well, yeah, this is one I hear about quite often. People go, oh, they're fighting with World War One era aircraft. Oh, they look like World War One aircraft, aircraft, era aircraft. Because it's a biplane. They're actual, in the technological terminologies of that period, perfectly reasonable reasons for why the Royal Navy have a biplane. It's fairly sensible for what they wanted to do when they're ordering it. And they also have its successor coming in, and its successor successors plan. Small boats alone save the British Expeditionary Force of Dunkirk. This is one of those strange things that comes up, because yes, the small boats are very, very useful. And they make the last efforts far more straightforward and far more to the point. But then when people focusing on some of the mythology, some of the stuff focusing on them, which is the route is deserved. Also, then forgets the cruisers, destroyers, all the other ships which would have been doing uh, ferries, which have been doing it for days and going backwards and forwards, and were carrying out hundreds of a time aboard them. Some of the destroyers were loaded with as many as 900 soldiers. It, it, they need to, you need to remember the whole force is the whole point, and that is the problem in the mythology in that one. And then the final myth that the Axis ever really had a chance. That is the one which is going to probably cause a lot of people to be upset with me. Hmm? C'est la vie. So, the Royal Navy was dominated by battleship admirals and gunnery officers. Well, yeah, there are issues with that. The first thing usually you have to remember is that... Gunnery training and even torpedo training, to extent, are the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s equivalent of a warfare course. Yeah, that sounds strange to say it, but here's the point. What is your primary weapon in that period? It's guns. Doesn't matter whether you're on a destroyer, torpedo boat, cruiser, capital ship. Doesn't matter. It's guns. For most of the 1920s and 1930s, you can argue the most powerful, single most powerful weapon at the disposal of an aircraft is it being used as a spotting aircraft to direct battleship guns. That's usually quite shocking to people. But this is one of the other reasons why battleship admirals are not really battleship admirals. There's also, and this is Henderson's, career, and Henderson is the third sea lord I was mentioning earlier, you know, he starts off in destroyers, he 
does a period of roughly three years aboard Extremis Erin as the executive officer, but, you know, he's doing that. It's his own, pretty much his only time on a, on a battleship. Uh, after Jutland, he's one of the officers that goes to the Admiralty. He writes the reports which lead to convoys. So he's an anti-summary warfare and strategic warfare specialist. In 1919, he's sent to be the flag captain and chief of staff on the China Station commander, uh, to the uh, China Station's commander-in-chief. And he gets the brand new Hawkins-class cruiser HMS Hawkins as his ship. Then becomes an instructor at the Greenwich Naval Academy. Hmm, does pretty well there. Uh, in 1976, he's given command of HMS Furious, aircraft carrier. Serves in this role till 1928. Then he goes off and does all sorts of random things between 1928 and 1931. Then he's made the first Rear Admiral aircraft carriers. Um, first ever in the Royal Navy Rear Admiral aircraft uh, Rear Admiral aircraft carriers. He's succeeded in that role by Alexander Ramsey, who goes on to become the first Fifth Sea Lord when that role is reinstated. And the Fifth Sea Lord is the member of Sea Lords who is in charge of the fleet's air arm. And from roughly 1933, he was the third Sea Lord Control Navy. Now, there is a dispute over whether he takes over in 1933 or 34. The f there is a transition period in the Royal Navy where the third Sea Lord would often, you know, if it was going properly, the person who's going to take over would turn up early, and learn the post from the current third sea lord. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a lovely sort of scenario. Um, the gentleman who was before Henderson hated the job. It's best I can describe it as uh, he absolutely hated the job, and basically Henderson turns up and Forbes goes. I love the navy. I love the constructors. I love the ships we can build. I absolutely despise dealing with the politicians. I'm going to off for a few months. If you need me, call me, but otherwise you are in charge. You deal with them. And um, not in those words, but in various terminology, Anne Henderson is left to build the Navy. And he will be the person who orders HMS Ark Royal HMS, the whole illustrious class, um, the implacables, and um, Unicorn, which of course becomes the model of the light fleet carriers, and pretty much everything else. That the Royal Navy we use in World War II is based on his designs, it's based on his work. And then when you look through the remaining admirals, well, the thing that comes out more, and you can actually make this case almost more than you can the case for them being battleship admirals, especially as when the debate lines that come across with the battleship admirals are often what people are saying in the 1920s versus what they're saying in the 1930s. And for some reason, Windows is now trying to tell me, look at your memories from last July. Not at the moment. Thank you, Windows. Anyway, uh, so they are in the 1920s. What's their approach to aviation? What's their approach to a lot of things versus what's their approach in the 1930s? And people sometimes use their quotes from the 1920s and go, look, this admiral was a battleship admiral because they say this in the 1920s. And you go, well, that's the 1920s. We would... Uh, there is a problem with some of the cultural memory of history. In that the cultural memory of history tends to be very, very short-sighted. And by this, what do I mean? And I... Last time I used that phrase, I got all sorts of comments on it going, was I being rude about people being blind or that? No, no, no. I mean short-sighted literally in you only see what's immediately in front, in front of you. And sometimes people do this. Uh, it's what, more what people do as a thing. Uh, 
not people who actually have any issues with their eyesight. It's more a case of some people. We all, we all know some people can do this. They will see, and there could be a burning building behind, but their brand new car or something in the front, they go, look, isn't it magnificent? And everyone else is going, can you not see that behind it? No, because I am just looking at my beautiful car. Or whatever. Yeah. That kind of short-sighted is what I'm talking about. And in terms of cultural history, it tends to remember when suddenly the aircraft come in and there's a big impact. There's a big thing. It's one of the curious things about it is Taranto is there. Pearl Harbor is there. Uh, Merzal Kabir happens before both of those. Uh, all sorts of things happen. You know, Bismarck gets hit by a torpedo. All sorts of interesting things happen in World War II. And the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers and all, all sorts of, ca uh, you know, battles during World War II. And yet, what people really remember is the dominance of the aircraft at the end of World War II. They remember the capabilities of the aircraft when they're looking, uh, when they're sort of talking about them in the 1950s, etc. You know, when they're hearing about them afterwards, how great they were. And there is almost an assumption that they were like that the whole way through the war. They weren't. The aircraft available in 1939 were not the aircraft available in 1941. They weren't. And that is another problem you sometimes get in that sometimes people start comparing the aircraft the Japanese Navy to the Royal Navy when they entered World War II. And you go, well, hang on. You've had two years. The Royal Navy's had two years of war fighting using whatever's available and competing with the Air Ministry who have managed to make an absolute muck up of it. And that is one of the reasons why there is a Minister of Munitions, etc., uh, put in charge of all the factory program and sorting out. Because the Air Ministry have. God love them for all their efforts and please. Never think this is a critique of the Air Ministry in that they were not doing their level best for the country. But they had some really weird ideas. They had some really weird ideas. But no, the Admirals... They have evolved. And there have been a lot of them. This is, again, one of the things when you expand this, so you see there's been a lot of Admirals each with their own particular views in various roles in the Sea Lords. And this is not widening out into the wide Admiralty staff. There's all sorts of officers in that group as well. And the reality is, if I was going to pick a group which you could actually argue are dominant, it's not battleship admirals, it's destroyer admirals. The amount of these officers who have been rear admiral destroyers, who have been destroyer commanders, destroyer officers, is amazing. But it also makes quite a lot of sense because when you look at it, you go, "What is the early? What is the lowest rank that can get experience coordinating a group of ships? Experience in that whole." task force, task group leadership role. Oh! That would be a destroyer flotilla leader. Or a divisional flotilla leader. They can be commanders, lieutenant commanders sometimes, occasionally. Uh, or, cap uh, you know, occasionally they're captains, but they can be junior to that. I can sort of see whereby they might get experience, and then there's a specific Rear Admiral destroyers in both the Home Fleet, Mediterranean Fleet, and there's usually others which turn up, etc., various points. So, not only do they have two specific ranks which are in senior commands, senior com technically third in command of their formations, of the home fleet and the Mediterranean, so the two prestigious fleets, but they have all this command experience. So when someone turns around and says to me, "Oh, the Royal Navy was dominated by the battleship, you know, admirals, and they didn't understand the way warfare was changing, and they didn't understand that the smaller ships were coming through," honestly, I usually treat it 
like I treat all questions on this channel, broadly speaking, as it's someone who has read some of the books out there, especially some of the popular histories, which do put that for that view. But my f consistent thinking about those historians is they've assumed they've been battleship admirals. They've assumed they have been because battleships are prestigious and because of they may be found something that was said in the 1920s. And they haven't actually checked the careers of those officers involved. They haven't actually checked what they did and what they've done. If they did, they'd find out they were destroyer admirals. <laughs> it gets even worse during World War II. I mean, uh, there is... Philip Vian's a good example. He starts off World War II as a captain of a destroyer flotilla. By the end of World War II, he's, I think, if you're a vice admiral acting sort of admiral in charge of the aircraft carriers of the British Pacific Fleet. Uh, Mountbatten also starts World War II as a destroyer flotilla leader. The number of senior officers in the Royal Navy who start off World War II as flotilla leaders, and by the end of World War II, due to the the cycle of officers, due to the fact that they've lost people, uh, due to the fact they need to grow the service, the service grows from two hundred thousand to nearly a million. You find a lot of destroyer officers have gone up in rank quite quickly. So, here is the first thing. The Royal Navy didn't understand value naval aviation. Well, they had the most aircraft carriers of anyone prior uh, during the interwar years. Most number of hulls. Most number of carriers. The Americans had the two biggest. And arguably the two best of the conversions, definitely. Lexington and Saratoga. I might have problems with their 8-inch guns. But... And there are various reasons put forward about why they were given eight inch. Uh, they were given the eight inch guns that they were put forward, uh, that were put on them. But let's be honest. All the entire reasoning is Congress, under the, even though the Washington Treaty didn't want to, but didn't limit the number of the cruisers you could build. As long as they were under ten thousand tons, you could build as many as they could. Congress didn't give them enough money for cruisers, so they were worrying about their uh, worrying about what were converted battle cruisers and quality of aircraft and all those sort of things, so they compromised the design by putting in 8-inch guns. And those guns are rapidly changed at the beginning of World War II. They are, both their gun systems, as I've done in the, the video about Lexington and Saratoga's key ships, both their gun systems are taken off them, and I think they're used for defense of Hawaii? I think so. the Hawaiian Islands get their 8-inch guns? But the point is, they the Americans had the two biggest, but the British had the most ships and the most experience. They had them operating around the world. They were doing multi-carrier operations. The entire reason they did a rear did a rear admiral aircraft carriers is because they tried doing multi-carrier operations with the rear with the admiral in charge of battle cruisers coordinating the aircraft carriers as well, and it wasn't working. And they tried it in three years of exercises. Thinking bigger, faster carriers would make it more work. No, it doesn't. Because the carriers have to go off and do their own things. And the British develop a whole multi-carrier doctrine. Leading up to World War II, they have entire philosophy built around multiple carriers operating. One of the reasons why they are prepared because of the needs of operating around the world. And again... Usually people then focus in on the Mediterranean because that's when they end up fighting. So it must have been British built armoured carriers to fight in the Mediterranean. No. Uh, that was a fact. They did think about the Mediterranean, but they also thought about the North Sea. But more importantly to them was fighting on the other side of the world from their infrastructure and industrial base. They spent most of the 1920s and 30s worrying about war with Japan. That was the big potential issue, because Japan was a big potential issue. Uh, the British knew that there were two factions within Japan. One, they could do business with. The other one was nuts, as far as they were concerned. The trouble was... Most of the other powers in the world, in British experience, seemed to focus in on the louder one of those factions, which was the nutty faction. And this made it very difficult to do business with Japan. Britain had managed to get the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty through by dealing with the other faction. The 
faction they felt they could work with. Please note, neither faction are particularly great, but, you know, there's one faction which the British find more easy to work with, and as a rule, most nations, when they actually found people that are from that faction, found them easier to deal with than the other faction. And broadly speaking, you tended to find this faction in the navy and this faction in the army. <sighs> broadly speaking. Not a hundred percent. So, Britain had spent a lot of time focusing on fighting in the Far East. And they knew various things they were going to need for that in terms of their operations. So one of those was making their carriers as strong a survival as they could be. This is why even Ark Roll, which is not an armoured carrier, has her flight deck as her strength deck and is made of very thick steel. So that is supposed to make it more survivable and more easily able to repair. Because they want to be able to repair these things as far forward as they can do. If they can... and. This is one of the things about Singapore, which is often misunderstood. People think we're not planning to fight a war from against Japan from Singapore. No, no. Singapore was supposed to be theatre entry industrial hub, basically maintenance, uh, forward repair, ma major forward major repair, maintenance stuff where where ships could be triaged and sent off to Australia or sent to India or sent home, or repaired there preferably and sent back to quickly. And basically, that's what it's supposed to be. The British were planning to, you know, for a war with Japan, they are planning to go through the south, up through the South China Sea, probably leapfrog up the coast of China, take a retake Wei Hai Wei if it's been lost, Hong Kong if it's been lost, probably operating from Wei Hai Wei, maybe Tsingtao, they might try and go for that as well, Monday Kingdo, um, and they would use that to enforce a blockade on Japan. That was the British war plan for Japan. And the idea was that any attacks on their forward base would be dealt with, would be limited by submarines like the T-class submarines, which I'll get into in a second, uh, which would of course be quite great, good ambush predators for that scenario. And the Royal Navy would pulse out from the Mediterranean fleet, would get to Hong Kong, uh, get to Singapore first. And then the home fleet reinforcements would join them, and then they'd move up that way and gather with the force of empire. The British also had a sneaking suspicion the United States would join in as well, because the British had a, had just the same idea about it as the Americans did, that you can't afford for there to be a scenario where one or the other power humbles Japan alone, because that will set them up as the dominant power in the Far East, and will undermine your position in the Far East. So... Britain couldn't afford America to fight Japan alone under any of those 1930s scenarios, and America could not afford Britain to fight Japan alone under those 1930s scenarios, because either way, they lose their status and position. And you might go, well, that's harder for them to join a war. Well, the nicer way, neither the British or the Americans were going to start the war. They were going to do the war as being the attacked party. So we would give both a reason for Casas Belli. They could market it up, and also it would be a, the thing was the way the British were planning to strike it was very much a limited naval war. They were certainly not in plan uh, planning on invading the Japanese home islands. That was not something the British were going to look into and think about. Their plan was literally: we have studied the world's oceans and trade. We will do a cutoff, and then that comes in with the aircraft carriers because if you're dependent upon air power for part of the air defence of your fleet, because that is part of the British doctrine, was fighters would break up enemy airstrikes on the outer group, then artillery would break those groups up even more, heavy artillery would break those groups up even more, and then individual aircraft, which would get, might get through that, and ones or two, ones, hopefully, would be dealt with by the medium AA. That was the British doctrine for air defence. It's sort of, it's a layered air defence system. And yeah, your aircraft might take some out. Great, if they do, brilliant. But their mo major role is to break up the enemy airstrikes. Your heavy artillery might take some enemy aircraft out. Great if they do. It doesn't matter though much because their major role is to break up those, gr uh, those groups which have made it through the fighters into e one's perfectly single aircraft. Because it's far easier for a, a, a warship to deal with a single aircraft attacking it than multiple aircraft and from multiple angles. 4C demonstrates that. So, you know, the loss of 
repulse and the loss of Prince of Wales demonstrates the exact problem in that scenario. Without having the fighters, without having the carrier there to break it up and to break up those strikes, you just can't manage it. So the British had worked through a doctrine. And this means their carriers are important. Their carriers are going to be providing four critical roles. Reconnaissance. And especially this is important if the British are going to do their night fighting plan, because their plan was always to try and fight the enemy at night, when other people weren't practicing and weren't exercising. The British have been left with a load of trauma from World War One. Every nation, navy in many ways, is reacting to their various versions of trauma from World War One. The Americans missed out on a big battle, and so they become obsessed with fighting the big battle. The British... I felt that the enemy had escaped from at night, so they become obsessed with fighting at night. They felt the enemy had hidden in harbour with them, so they was again obsessed with attacking ships in harbour. Aircraft carriers are a critical part of this. Courageous, glorious, Ark Royal are their free strike carriers at the beginning of World War Two. They managed to lose two of those. One of those on anti-submarine operations because the British have been doing so much anti-submarine warfare work again. Legacy of World War One. They've been doing lots of exercises, and in all those exercises, aircraft have been really, really useful for attacking submarines. Really critical for hunting them down and attacking them. One small problem, uh, they've done it in exercise areas where there's a limited space and those submarines are obeying those rules and are, you know, in a, it develops a false positive scenario of ASDIC, etc. and everything working, which the British find out very quickly in World War II that ASDIC is good but you need multiple ships to engage that a ship uh, that the, there can be in the time that you move from you lose contact to engage with depth charges the submarine can move and get away from you and two that if your only option as a carrier available for this operation is a fleet carrier you really don't want to be using that for anti-submarine warfare operations because it's rather useful and expensive and a multi-use asset that if you lose in that scenario it's going to look stupid and the thing is the British lose HMS Courageous doing that but what people forget is that they also had other carriers including Ark Royal out doing that at the same time because in all the exercises the submarine had never reached the aircraft carrier and maybe just maybe if this had taken place in 1942, because remember, the British had been planning, the 10-year rule had been cancelled by the government in 1932, so the Royal Navy, all services are planning on war in 1942 or after, and let's be honest, the 10-year rule had really only actually been uh, cancelled in the Treasury terms in 1937. So they've had five years to prep for uh, what they thought was, uh, they had, well, they've had two of their five preparation years. It, some of these things might well have worked in, in 1942 as a doctor in 1942 when they'd have had more escorts uh, more anti-submarine warfare vessels they were looking into escort carriers it's one, again, one of those things that comes up again people go oh it's a wartime emergency design it's, it's really not the concept is hanging around the actual selection of the ships and the building of the system that is wartime Yeah, I will fully put that there but the fact is the British have been using Argus for a long time, Hermes, all these sort of escort carrier-like vessels, and yeah, they had plans, and I think, I think it really would have been kind of interesting if war had been held off a little bit longer, but it wasn't. So the British have a naval aviation doctrine, they have understand the value of it. Their naval aviation is uh, one of their primary strike assets. It's going to be used for taking out the enemy fleet hiding in harbour. That's what they do at Taranto. That's what Ark Royal is built around. That's what the Royal Navy does at Merza Kabir. They do this repeatedly. They understand the value of naval aviation and they want it. But people then go, well, what about their aircraft? Well, you have a perfect storm. You have the fact that Supermarine are building probably what's going to be the a, a gullwing version of a Spitfire is basically the best way to describe it. There's a couple of other companies as well also doing single seat fighters for the Royal Navy, but my strong suspicion is Supermarine would have won it. The trouble is the Air Ministry goes, ah, because the Air Ministry are having a panic attack because they've been focusing 
So much on Bomber Command, because for them, that was the way of defending the UK, was having a Bomber Command, because bombers would always get through. And suddenly they've turned around to what is the Royal Navy's view on that, on sort of air defence. In that, no, 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 you need fighters, you need radar, you need all sorts of things. They have been developing radar, and the MSU have been involved in that. Please, don't get me wrong. Navy were also involved in that. And they're developing radar and trying to, and the Royal Navy's deployed radar on their ships prior to World War II. They've got radar on some of their cruisers and some of their destroyers wandering around and some of their aircraft carriers. And that's good. They like radar because it really makes their air defense system work. Because suddenly you can direct the fighters instead of what they have been doing is using swordfish <laughs> up there with the observer and the tail air gunner both having binoculars <laughs> looking out and scanning the sky to try and spot aircraft coming in. That was literally one of the roles of the swordfish. And it's been a role of Royal Navy aircraft since the Blackburn Blackburn at this point. Airborne early warning. So then we have submarines. Okay, well... The usual point is this was goes to the... The Germans produced hundreds of submarines through World War II. Why did the Royal Navy not? Well, there's two reasons for that. One, the German Navy basically becomes a sub large submarine service at several points with other things just added on it. Secondly, the Royal Navy has a problem in that the tar there aren't as many targets for its staff for the Germans. <laughs> Their submarines do good work. If you look at some of the stories about the coastal uh, convoys of the Axis going up Europe, they would they not have a nice time with Royal Navy submarines. There was uh, the fact that at one point they almost lost three light cruisers in a single day in a kind of uh, treatment of what the British had uh, British had received with Abacur, Cressy, and Hogue. And this is the big thing for the Royal Navy. They lost three cruisers in World War One. They have got an absolute nightmare when it comes to submarine warfare. They are obsessed by it. There is a reason they put hydrophones and ASDIC and all sorts of things on their cruisers, even. It's not because they want their cruisers to anti-submarine warfare, which comes up sometimes. People go, oh, they were planning on using them to drop depth charges. They do have depth charges sometimes carried. But they're not. Real. They're only supposed to be doing it if they're doing it. It's because they've got no other choice and they can't run. Uh, the primary role for cruisers in having those sort of those sort of systems is so they can hear torpedoes and hear submarines and move out the way. Combine that with a propensity to zigzag so that's so great that I was I'm fairly certain the Royal Navy still to this day when walking down a corridor they slightly zigzag. Watch a Royal Navy officer actually walking down a corridor. I think the zigzagging has got so ingrained that they automatically zigzag. Even on la land. Watch them. Watch Actually watch them walking down a corridor. I swear they will still zigzag. It, without even thinking about it. They'll be sort of zigzagging as they walk. Because it's so ingrained. Now, you then look at what's happening happens in the Far East. It's Royal Navy submarines operating with US Navy submarines out of Australia. They do a good job there. And that's the thing. The Royal Navy has designed their T-Class to be the absolute best ambush predator they can make them. And that was their plan for dealing with the Japanese, and especially for dealing with the Japanese once you got to a close blockade for a scenario, because the submarines would have been doing the close blockade. And would have also been doing the ambush on any Japanese forces trying to get to Singapore. That was sort of the plan of the war effort. That's why they can fire 10 sort of torpedoes forward. So basically they can sit, they can fire a spread of torpedoes and then get out of there. And the thing is, if you've got 10 torpedoes running in on you as a group, you're going to know about it. You're going to know about it. On top of this, you have the Royal Navy submarines in the Mediterranean. The U-Class out of 10th Flotilla in, Mal in Malta do an absolutely... Well, some would call it the precision job on the Axis convoys, in that they do tend to be very good at targeting fuel tankers. Uh, they do take their time and make sure they get the right ship on a, in a convoy. 
And then there's all the special operations formations that they're doing and the support they're doing for them all the way up and down the Axis European coast, even insertions into uh, Japanese controlled territories, they are putting in special operations personnel. Whether they be MI6 agents, whether they be SOE, whether they be commandos, they're putting them in. Royal Navy wasn't preparing for a war, only started preparing in World War II, 1939. There's a small issue with this. As said, you have the reality that Britain is preparing for war in 19, 1942 or afterwards. So, what you should look at is, instead of presuming that they knew war was going to happen in September 1939... Think, look at their plans and go, right then, so how are you, what, what phase are you at in construction? They've planned and worked out, thanks to their constant work with sloops, that's the small ships which were treaty compliant, but as long as they were less than 2,000 tons, didn't carry over a certain number of 3-inch guns. Uh, basically, a gun's greater than a 3-inch, they can only carry 4 of didn't carry torpedoes and weren't designed for a speed greater than 20 knots, you can build as many as you like and there's no treaty immunizations beyond those criteria. So the Royal Navy have been doing a constant sloop program since about, interesting enough, since the beginning of the 1930s and Henderson really had pushed us through. And suddenly in 1938 when they are let's put this away, a year into actual 10-year rule being off with the Treasury actually giving up, uh, allowing them to start spending freely, or at least more freely. What do they, what do, they do? They start put, They take those requirements for what they need for an anti submarine warfare vessel, for an escort vessel with heavy AA and ASW capabilities, off the shelf. They go, these are what we need, from shown by exercises and the designs we've tested. Okay, let's build. Now, there are issues. I'm not sure myself I would argue that a Hunt-class escort destroyer is fast enough for what they were talking about. But it's certainly capable enough, and it's capable of escorting the battle fleet. And by that, I mean any fleet travelling with Nelson and Rodney. And that's going to be a major part of the fleet. It's capable, they are capable of escorting convoys out to the Far East. They're capable of uh, doing patrol duties. They're capable of doing all sorts of things. Add the flag class corvettes into them and the sheer numbers being ordered. And you have a very large amount of force available. She is ordered. A fully complete design is ordered in March 1939. As anyone who knows the process of ship design and procurement will go, uh, go just think about it from the basic ma uh, think about it from the point of view of all the complicated complications that you have to design into the ship, all the systems you have to fit in, all the power for radar and all those things to be added in to take it. They're designing it to have you know it has to have loos, it has to have galleys you realise that's not going to have been a we ordered it and then we designed it between March and June. No. Uh, they, The Royal Navy and the naval constructors have been working on the design for about nine months at this point, which means the specifications had been finalised at least in June 1938. We're not quite sure. We know they're definitely finalised by, because they're talking about them having already been finalised, by August 1938. So, theoretically, it could have been July, but the probability is the specifications have been designed by June. They could have rushed along, but again, they think they have time. They're operating on the concept they have time, and Henderson himself is looking at the German construction, the Japanese construction. The Japanese construction takes far more precedence than the German. It goes Japanese, Italian, German in British mindset. And there's a reason for this, and it comes into this one. 
the German fleet is tiny. Their submarine force is tiny. Yes, they have a mustachioed man making big statements and grandiose things, and they're talking about Plan Z and all these things. The British know about that. The British are not really as worried by that as some people like to try and think about, because frankly, for the British, that's not much of a problem. You see, the German construction is all vaporware at this point. It's none of it's been built. They're talking about building it. The Italians actually do have and are building it. The Italians are going to have six battleships. They're going to have six battleships at the beginning of World War II. Germany never has more than four. And let's be honest, two of those have 11-inch guns. And no, that doesn't make them battle cruisers. I know that there is an entire video about what are battle cruisers and what are not battle cruisers on this channel. That does not make them battle cruisers because they have 11-inch guns. Those were just the biggest and best guns they could build at the time, and they were planning on upgrading the 15-inch. But they were the biggest they had available at the time were 11-inch guns, so that's what they were fitted with. And they are built to be fast battleships. You can tell that by their subdivision, their structuring, their design. But the whole point is, the big worry, the big fleet you have to deal with, is the second, by treaty, second largest, because remember, Britain and America are joint first, the second largest, by treaty, navy in the world, aka Japan. Which is on the other side of the world from your infrastructure base, from your all your support. That is what the British are worrying about and the Royal Navy is worrying about when they're talking about construction. Germany doesn't even have a decent submarine program at this point. They do not have any maritime infrastructure mass construction going on. The British are watching it. The British have as you can imagine, a nation which spent as much effort and diplomatic and political effort as it did in you making sure the Versailles Treaty will absolutely ruin German maritime infrastructure industry. Not destroy it completely, but ruin it by very carefully making sure that any efforts to build it up to will make it will be very, very difficult and starting from a very low point and would therefore mean that you couldn't build up a navy rapidly. That's the thing. The Germans can't build up a navy rapidly. They can't even rebuild losses rapidly of the navy they do have. So that hasn't been as big a focus on British, drive, uh, British construction. And this is a good thing because it factors into sea line. Because if Germany won the Battle of Britain, they would have won Operation Sea Line. Well, they don't have any destroyers really wandering around this point. Well, they have a couple, but not many. They lost most of them in Narvik in Norway. And they've got a whole load of other ships damaged. And this is one of the reasons why Lutschens is coming up with uh, such a great ideas as... Let's put... Sink some of our pre-Dreadnought style battleships, let's sink them on various reefy things or, you know, shallow water bits and they can be used as batteries which can provide fire support to the troops ashore and protect them from attacks. And the question is, really? Because you're talking about a service which has spent most of the 1920s and 30s focusing on night fighting. So, yeah, let's say you do manage to cross a force and trust them today, and you can make it, so you have somehow, somehow with the aircraft you have built, which are not, and the Luftwaffe as you created it, which is fine for what you wanted to do. Fine for what you wanted to do in terms of your initial operations. but is not really designed or set up at this point in any way, shape or form for a persistent air campaign, let alone providing air support and, most importantly, importantly air cover across the channel. 
and across the distance you have to cover and hasn't yet got the anti-ship arms that you will really look forward to having because they are start development and starts organizing them after Norway that's when the Flieger Corps X and all these things start being worked on yeah, it's going, to be going it's after the Norwegian experience they start developing they're not available for most of the planning of sea line in fact they're not even available at the end of the planning of sea line so in terms of actual operational capability I, th I think they're on paper but it's a case of have you got the aircraft have you reached have you managed to train them up because again getting a force ready is not just about going right then we have Joe blogs we have the aircraft we stick them in they fly no You don't just stick a, or person A, add them to plane, send them off to fly. No, you have to do a lot of training. You have to do a lot of training both as an individual pilot in doing the individual or individual air crew, doing the individual duties and working as an air crew in an aircraft, and then it's working as an air group with the other aircraft. It takes a lot of time to reach the qualities you want to reach. You don't just automatically become it because you are it. Doesn't work like that. So, you also have the fact that post Norway, post Dunkirk, the Royal Navy goes on a massive upgrade, AA upgrade and program. Um, a number of destroyers get fitted with extra, with twin four inch guns to replace their 4.7 inch guns. Some new destroyers get launched with only twin four inch guns. And they also build, well, they start adding Bofors 40 millimeters, uh, Bofors uh, 40 millimeters, pom poms, pretty much anything they can get hold of, they are adding. Uh, it's just obscene the sheer amount of AA firepower they're adding to their ships. They were already heavily armed on AA terms compared to others in 1939. It wasn't enough. But they'd been heavily armed. This meant that they had a very s solid infrastructure base to work from and upgrade from. Again, this is an advantage. This is something both the US Navy and the Royal Navy enjoy. They have an infrastructure base they can work from. In the US case, they can build masses of new infrastructure because they have the space and they have the support. In the British case, they have masses of infrastructure that they have been building and maintaining for centuries. They can use it. Whoopee. So, if Germany won the Battle of Britain, they would have won Operation Sea Line. No. And this is not even including the various nasty kind of creations which that group known as the British Home Guard were coming up with. Uh, the Home Guard can best be categorised as this. You have a there's a global idea of them produced from Dad's army, which is a lot of fun and a very cool comedy. But then here is the reality. Imagine you're fifty, late forties, early fifties, maybe early sixties year old granddad. Imagine he has fought in a world war already. A really nasty world war. Imagine him being told that the Germans have a propensity, and he knows this from the First World War, he already has this idea, but having looked at what they've done in other countries, that they are have a propensity of shooting first and asking questions later. Now, his sons are off probably serving in the forces or are somewhere else. They're off doing things like that. But he has his wife. He might well have his daughters and daughters-in-law in his local area and his grandchildren. Then you give him a gun and you tell him that he's got to buy time for those family members, i.e. his wife, his daughters, daughters-in-laws, his grandchildren, to get to safety. 
he has got to defend his country to stop what happened and what he saw happen in Belgium, in northern France, happening in the UK, happening in his home. And it is his home territory, the place he knows like the back of his hand. A. Imagine how inventive those people get. But B. Also, imagine what fighting is going to be like. Especially at this point in World War Two, And then imagine you do, you're trying to fight them and your supplies have been cut off. Or the Royal Navy is just, uh, just, you know... Honestly, with considering the amount of flat-bottom river barges they're planning on using, a high-speed dash, as someone put it in the live, by the Royal Navy's destroyers could well have won that operation for them. By just creating enough enough waves that enough wakes that the all the flat bottom craft go flip. No, Operation Sea Lion at no point is a sensible plan at all. Now, Swordfish was a relic of an aircraft. It wasn't. The Swordfish was unfortunately coming to the likely end of its service life because if you consider it's usually four to six years before a new type takes over and the British had already ordered the Barracuda and the Albacore to try and bide in those extra two years in terms of the Royal Navy the trouble is there's been the transition of the fleet air arm from dual control i.e. Air Ministry Administration, Royal Navy Operational Control, Royal Navy providing roughly 70% of the pilots, but the Air Ministry controlling all the training and all the ranks of the people in terms of their flying ranks. It's all sorts of weird fun, okay? But the Inskip Award of 1937, which was a year after the Sword of Agenda Service, had decided that the Royal Navy was going to get control, and that was transition was going to be completed in 1939. So this is the problem for the Royal Navy in that this is a period of transition for the aircraft. However, saying that, this aircraft is still very, very cool and very, very clever. For three reasons. One, it is designed to be as rugged and reliable and easy to maintain as physically possible. Again, designed for operating the other side of the world from the infrastructure base. It makes sense. Two, it is designed to be as easy to fly and as stable as possible to make launching torpedoes better and to allow for long-range night attacks with precision. And thirdly, and this is what really makes it cool and really makes it one of the most dangerous aircraft you're going to fight in World War II. If you drop a normal torpedo from an aircraft, what it does is boom, that, basically, because the heavy part is here. This part tends to have an engine and air in it, so it tends to be less dense, whereas this part tends to be the explosive part. And that tends to be more denser, and it tends to do that. And it tends to go down deep and then come up. And at sea, it might well come up and hit its target. But um, in a harbour, it's probably going to hit the floor and stay there. Okay, some people think, well, let's add extra fins, give them more wings. So we'll put some wooden fins on here. And so the torpedo comes down and it goes in a little bit better. Still, as the Japanese found at Pearl Harbor, it hits rather a lot of uh, the floor. And so they don't tend to work that well. The British come up with an, came up with another uh, methodology which mm, works best when using a biplane. And also when you're flying slow enough. Again, biplane. Attention wire. So you have the fins at the back. But you also have a tension wire. And the tension wire breaks off the aircraft, but it maintains tension enough time for us going down so that the torpedo belly flops. Boop. And it runs nice and shallow along in, the, uh, along in the water and doesn't hit the bottom. So yeah, swordfish, not a relic of an aircraft. Rather useful. <sighs> right. So, this is one of those scenarios where if you think about a war as just being the point at which when the shooting starts, you're right. 
British involvement starts in September 1939. If you think about a war being more than that, being shaping the conflict, being when you're pointing guns at other nations' ships, and they're pointing guns at you, and when you're talking about your ships and allied ships getting attacked, when you're having to evacuate civilians, when you're having to do almost daily deterrence operations and what we would call conflict shaping maneuvers. Well, the British were involved in dealing with the Italians in Abyssinia and Mediterranean for a long time, but also the British were involved in the Far East. There's the Tsingtao incident, which I've talked about on this channel quite a lot in January 1939. In the Far East, where HMS Birmingham is pointing guns at the Japanese. Free cruisers. They're pointing guns at her. She's pointing guns at them. Over a British-flagged merchant vessel. In Tsingtao, or Qingdao Harbour. This is not unusual for the Far East, and it wasn't unusual from about 1930... 1935 onwards. In fact, almost every January and every June and every July there are incidents. Not sure why specifically those three months seem to be so popular, but they do in that scenario. Someone once put the uh, put the idea of the weather for uh, the weather patterns to me, and I went, mm, yeah. yes and no. That doesn't really work. It. It explains some of it, but doesn't explain it all fully. So, yes. World War II. The trouble is, is when we start to see it as a, as a surprise. They were preparing for war. They just thought they had a few more years before it went hot. They thought they could buy more time. And let's be honest... If mustachioed gentlemen, okay, Adolf Hitler, hadn't been quite such a gambling gentleman, and quite such a person who wanted to go for it all right now, he had no patience, uh, they might have been right. They might well have been right. Because... I don't see the scenario with Japan. Maybe December 1941, 1942 is when the conflict breaks out. Maybe still. Probably. As Japan's timeline probably doesn't change that much. But I can't be 100% sure. But I think they would have been quite right on that one. And that's the trouble is the timeline is based on Japan. That's the one that's being the big threat. Germany wasn't ready. This is another thing which throws off the British estimations of when war's coming out, and all people, all, all the estimations of when war's coming. They know from intelligence that Germany's not ready for war. Germany's got a massive build up program, which it can't afford, but it's not ready. And they know the Italians aren't ready, and the Japanese aren't ready. That is probably a lesson for future historians and for future people making intelligence assessments. People starting wars are not logical and sometimes they don't wait for it to be ready because they think you are not as ready as they are. And the thing is, that's what we're getting onto, infrastructure is a big difference. Small boats alone save the British Expeditionary Force. There are so many destroyers. There are so many vessels involved. This is a destroyer. Laid it down with people. I once had an interesting discussion with someone who was telling me, Oh, yes, well, you know, uh, the, the, the soldiers didn't want to be below decks because uh, they're, um, they didn't want to, in case the destroyer was sunk, they didn't want to be trapped. I looked at them and went, 
Have you ever been aboard a World War II style destroyer? No. Go. There isn't a lot of space below decks. You see, from about this point to most of the way back there, that's engines and boiler rooms. And they literally go from side to side, top to bottom, in the hull. There is nothing in there for you to use. No space for you to go. Okay, you want to go full? Well, there's various stores, magazines, etc. There are, as you can see from these lovely um, scuttlings along here, uh, there are spaces below. But, again, sailors at this point were all using hammocks, so you have some spaces to go sit and eat in mess rooms, but you don't really have a lot of space. But trust me, they are mostly filled up, as are most of the limited nut supply officers' cabins. What are they filled up with? Sick people. People who are injured. People who are unwell, being looked after by me uh, by whatever medical personnel they can get hold of. That's who are, getting, who are in those spaces, in the protected spaces. If you're not injured, you're on the deck. They don't have space, with all the injured people on board, they don't have space for people to be milling around on the inside. They'll try and serve them hot drinks and things when they can, but mostly it's get them back to the UK as quickly as they can do. So yeah, there's a reason they're not inside. There isn't the space for them to be inside. Believe it or not, if you're taking 900 people aboard a ship which is designed for a normal crew of 160 to 200, they kind of overwhelm the facilities quite quickly. Unless you specifically design the ship with in what we would call enhanced hotel facilities. They don't have the space for them. Now, on the ferries, there was more space. But again, the ferries were loaded with sometimes thousands of people. So you'd find them standing on the decks as well. However, uh, here's the interesting thing where cultural memory comes in. Two points. You have the small boats, remembered as being this major force that comes in. Mostly their job is not to bring people back across the channel. Mostly they're bringing people out to the larger ships from the, various, uh, from the beaches. Speed up the offload of the beaches, then go back and then get more people and bring them out, out to the ships again. They do bring some across and do some uh, across, but they can't do that as quickly or as efficiently as these can. And that's not going to be an efficient use of them or an efficient use of these. But the culture member goes, oh yeah, we stood on that because we were scared of air attacks or these things. It provides a good reason in your head because of the fear of aircraft, which was still there, for why you're standing there. But the thing is, if there had been space, they would have been below. But there wasn't space. There wasn't space because, again, there would have been some protection in being below. From machine gun fire, from enemy aircraft attacking. Despite the RAF actually doing a fairly good job of trying to keep the Luftwaffe away from the beachheads. And then we have the final myth of today. That the Axis ever really had a chance. So, here is... Mm, Something I found, I think, a few years ago, um, and I can't remember where I found it, so if you create it, thank you, it's very good. The plan for Plan Z. And I've heard many things about Plan Z over the years. Uh, of the Royal Navy. Mm. Okay. There's this whole thing of when Germany had a lot more maritime infrastructure. They had this scenario called the Risk Fleet Theory. They were never trying to aim for parity. They were trying to aim to have enough force that they could, under the Risk Fleet, that the uh, British couldn't risk fighting them because if they did, the British would lose enough ships that they would then get attacked by everyone else in the world. The sole problem with the Risk Fleet Theory turned out to be that the Royal Navy can also build ships. And it can build them more quickly, more cheaply, and to an extent, you can argue for their own needs, better suited to the British needs than the Germans could build ones to suit to their needs, than Germany could. And this was in the run-up to World War I, when Germany had a lot more maritime infrastructure. 
So let's consider what we're talking about. This is supposed to be plan Z, and of those, the four in the middle actually get completed, and one of these carriers gets the hull finished, but doesn't get commissioned or in any way actually finished off. Um, none of the rest are built. None of the rest. Anywhere near any point of construction. So here is the serious question. Let's say it's peace. And let's say 1939 war doesn't break out. And someone actually said this is going to be parity by 1945. If you consider how much they've actually got constructed by, well, 1942, uh, ooh, I, I, I don't think they're getting anything of this in 1940. They, they'd have got much more constructed by 1945, even if it had been peace. They might have started in on these. But the moment Germany starts in on either completing aircraft carriers or finishing off these O vessels, let alone the H's, what's the Royal Navy going to do? Are they going to stand there going, they're so big, we can't do anything. Or are they going to go, design draw, build, They're building. That's what they're going to do. They're going to build. You know, as we discussed earlier, the Royal Navy are building six aircraft carriers. They are, well, it's actually quite an interesting it's a stat when we go back to it. They are, um, they have got five of the six fleet carriers under, under order and going through various process of construction. They've also got HMS Unicorn under construction. So they've got six carrier-like vessels, or five carriers and a forward aviation support ship, under construction. Please note, again, if so that's more than actually they've got under construction than the Germans actually managed to finish, let alone were and they are actually contemplating, let alone what they could finish. Uh, if we consider again, the Germans build... Scharnhorst, nice now. Bismarck, Tirpitz. That's what they complete. In roughly the same time, the British modernise. Queen Elizabeth. Warspite. Valiant. Renown. They build King George V. They build Prince of Wales, Duke of York, Anson, Howe. And Vanguard. That's the infrastructure differential we're talking about. And then we can go to the Italians and go, well, they had six. Surely you should include them in the num in numbers, Alex. I should do. And the Royal Navy do. And that's why every single modernised Queen Elizabeth class ca capital ship is in the Mediterranean. The British also have Nelson and Rodney floating around. And let's be honest, those two are not anything you should ever ignore. The Axis ever really had a chance. Let's put it this way. Denmark falls because they are overwhelmed too quickly. Norway falls because the Norwegian government believed that if they didn't react to Denmark falling and they didn't call their forces to alert, then the Germans wouldn't attack them. Basically, it was the idea was... If I look nice and kind, then the bullies won't be nasty to me. I suppose it depends on the bullies. But I don't really think it has a good history of working. But very quickly... Once infrastructure starts to uh, come, become a part of it, once you can no longer, you're not fighting a 
quick overwhelming operation you're fighting an operation which is going to be lasting years require infrastructure require constant maintenance and construction you have to realize you are taking on the British Empire and then for some reason they decide to take on the Soviet Union and the United States a communist dictatorship which is absolutely not bothered about how much loss of life it takes and the two largest infrastructure wise industrial collections in the world because again sometimes I see the results people go well you know comparing Germany to Britain Brit Germany can beat Britain in X Y or Z in terms of infrastructure you go compare Germany to the British Empire well you know if we don't want to do that compare Germany to the British Empire Ah, uh, ah, uh, oh. Yes. That is the advantage of the British. They have a huge amount of strategic depth. That is the advantage in all of these scenarios. And it's the problems for... None of them are ready for war, in terms of the Axis powers, when they go to war. And none of them have the infrastructure. And it is the worst thing to have to point this out sometimes when you're talking, walking students through it. Because at a certain point, it can mean that all those people died for nothing. Because there was never a chance of them winning. So they should have never started the war. But... Does it mean the Allies died for nothing? No, because the only way you you tend to stop a bully, especially a bully who's armed like that, is by standing up to them. And sadly enough, that's going to often incur loss of life. Because, again, wars are not fought clean. The other side gets a vote. Luck happens. Life happens. Ship happens. So even the best laid plans can go to pieces. So what are the values of myths? Well, the values of myths have um, is varied, but they do have a value. They are a good way of preserving some lessons from history. But they also have a value in that they often provide us with a version of rose-colored glasses to cover complicated nuance. <sighs> One of the questions I'm often put is why does the Royal Navy why is it so small today? Why is it so expensive to develop, build ships today compared to what it used to be? And one of the things answer to that is volume. If you're actually ordering more ships, it tends to cheaper to buy the individual ships. You have a greater throughput, you'll have more options. The UK now pretty much has single source suppliers for pretty much everything. And we can say, well, you know, we have we have multiple frigate factories. We do. One factory produces the light frigate, one produces the large frigate, and we'll probably be producing the destroyer. What will the light fa frigate factory probably be producing at that point? Probably next generation of light frigates. Because that's probably what we're going to keep going. And it could be helpful, and it would be sensible to do that, but we'll see. But the mythology that comes out of World War II is often mistaken. In... In terms of its context and its nuance. I was having an interesting discussion under HMS Ark Royals, uh, the video on my channel about HMS Ark Royal and the Key Ship series on technologies, and... So I was putting forward, well, you know, Royal Navy aircraft were terrible, and yet they're not. 
well, you know, they they have to get Hellcat, or they get wild, they get martlets, wildcats, and you know they need those in the in the 1941. I go, yeah, that's because the Royal Navy's fighter, which was supposed to be taking over in 1940-41, was cancelled. So that's the problem for the Royal Navy. It was cancelled because the the Royal Air Force needed it, not because the Royal Navy was terrible at picking out aircraft. They had plans for aircraft, they just didn't manage to get them. The thing that was supposed to replace the Gladiator in service and allow, mm, basically, for the Barracuda, which was going to be... Uh, it, it's an interesting aircraft. Um, for the British, it was still going to be a... Probably would still be a TSR. Because all British torpedo aircraft were supposed to be able to do dive bombing as well. The Royal Navy had been... The Swordfish could theoretically do dive bombing. And it did actually do dive bombing at certain points. If you want to be really scared, there were some interesting scenarios for people in in the in North Africa at certain points with uh, Swordfish dive bombing tanks. But... The point is... This history all has value. And the mythology... Uh, the mythology tends to come from what is the cultural memory. And the cultural memory is the big events which are memorized, which permutate everything. And the discussions I've had over the years of people have ranged from, oh, the Royal Navy didn't have aircraft carriers at all, to the Royal Navy only had one aircraft carrier, HMS Ark Royal. Um, it's been interesting. At certain points, I was told at one point that the Royal Navy didn't have any submarines because they didn't think submarines were gentlemen. Felt that submarines were ungentlemanly warfare, and you have to explain that actually, no, some of the most advanced submarines in the world in 1930s and 1940s were Royal Navy submarines. And when I say some of the most advanced submarines in the world, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that they are advanced in all forms of technology? No, because every nation was focusing their submarine construction a lot on the things they need them to do. And the Royal Navy are focusing their submarines on being ambush predators. That is what they're about. They're supposed to get to a location quite quickly. Go down. And wait. And be a nightmare for you. And they're good at that. They're not necessarily good at then what you need them to do by the end of World War II. Which is what leads to the A-class and various other developments. And again, that's another thing you have to remember. War changes. And during the war, when a lot of the cultural memories are being formed, there's a lot of there's limitation on the information being provided. There's a limitation on the knowledge being shared for obvious reasons. And so that can for a cause false memories to be created. In terms of a false national memory. But still, the mythologies are useful because they provide a point of access. And when you go and start reading in about the history, reading in the history, that's when you find out, hang on, the mythology isn't correct. And that's when you go, hopefully go and dig deeper. So, it's an avenue point into history. Right, and what have we got coming up? Uh, ooh. We are up to July the 18th, so next week. So that's building the fleets of Lisa. It's going to be a good, a good one. And then what we've got coming up next week as well in terms of live. We've got, at what point in the age of sail did the Royal Navy come closest to losing? Ooh, that's going to be fun. And tomorrow, well, after this comes out, hopefully it's all worked, we have got Brewships Ships 117, which is going to be a book review of some interesting books. I think it's going to be that pile of books. I think it's that pile of books. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I always end these videos with a question and um, I'm not going to change with this video. Today's question, and if you want to comment, it'll be quite enjoyable to hear, is this. What do you think If World War Two holds off to 1942, 
what do you think the British reaction, British and American reactions would have been to Germany managing to launch an aircraft carrier in an O-class and Japan revealing about Yamato and Mushashi? I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you very much for watching and um, take care.